Welcome to episode 157 of the CU Insight Experience. I'm Randy Smith, one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and this show is all about taking a deep dive with the leaders of the credit union movement that make it so great. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Q's, the credit union industry's leading talent development solutions provider. After listening to our show, learn more and register for CEO Dialogue uh, by visiting Q's dot org to join fellow CEOs in an open discussion tackling the industry's most pressing issues. And that sounds pretty cool. Today, I am having a conversation with Becky Reed. Becky is the CEO of Lone Star Credit Union and also the soon-to-be or new board chair, depending on when you're listening, of Nacuso. So let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Becky. Thank you for having me, Randy. Uh, I am I'm excited about this on so many different levels, not only the, the work that you've done over your career, but also your involvement in the CUSO. I am a huge CUSO fan and think there's so much that we can do. So but before we get to all of that and my excitement where I just go down rabbit holes and uh, don't even let people find out who you are if they don't know already. Um, can you give us a little background? How did your career start? And, you know, where are led you to are today in credit unions. Most of us didn't grow up saying someday I want to be a credit union leader. So. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I don't know that anybody, well, maybe some people wake up and go, you know, I, I think I want to be a credit union. CEO. <laughs> I don't think, you know, most people, as you talk about their careers and how they got there, I don't think any, most people would say that, uh, you know, they didn't dream as a child to be what they ended up being. But for me, I actually started my uh, career in retail. And so I managed a music store in the mall. Remember those? When you, you like, a, like an actual one where we went and bought CDs and cassettes and stuff, right? Absolutely. And, <laughs> and record albums. And records. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I had the, the wonderful opportunity to immerse myself in the music industry, which was really fun. But I was a retail manager, so the music stores were in the mall. And so, you know, really big on customer service and inventory management and all of that kind of stuff. And really, honestly, got tired of working weekends yep, <laughs> and, <course>. yeah. <laughs> and Christmas was like a nightmare. And so I was like, you know what? I, banking has been something that has always interested me. So I think I want to go do that. Plus, I get the perk of not having to work nights and weekends, right? Yeah, absolutely, so, right? Yeah. yeah. And customer service is customer service is customer service. I can do that. So I actually um, interviewed at several different financial institutions and got a job as a financial service officer at a credit union. And so there you go. That was back in 1996. Uh, so at that time, did you know, I, I'm a, a, I grew up in Metro Detroit. So it was like this idea that like credit unions, I always thought of, I mean, a lot of people thought of in that area that you had to be a part of the union to be a part of the credit union. Do you remember when, when you were interviewing for these financial services or these banking type positions? Did you know what a credit union was or were you like, oh, this seems like a? It My parents were members of a credit union and I didn't really understand the ideological differences between a bank and a credit union um, didn't understand the back end, you know, differences from a balance sheet, um, you know, income statement perspective. Uh, but what I did know is that you had to be part of some group in order to be able to join a credit union. So I knew that there was some sort of exclusivity to, you know, being a credit union member back then, most credit unions weren't community chartered. Right. Yep. Absolutely. My dad was an air traffic controller, so he worked for the federal government. So my assumption at that time was federal in the name of the credit union meant that federal <laughs> employees could join. And so that was pretty much what I knew about credit unions. My parents banked exclusively with credit unions my whole life. And so I, you know, I, I never had an opportunity to go into a Bank of America branch with them. You know, it was always the credit union. I had the same, actually. So my, my mother had her, her credit union account from her first job out of high school, which was the power company up in Michigan. So <laughs> that my association. My first car loan was a credit union. My first checking account was a credit union. You know, 
So, yeah, yeah. I do. <laughs> yeah. so I'd like to talk about challenges that credit unions are having that you're seeing before I kind of jump into a, a lot of the positives that I know I'm going to go down a, a million rabbit holes with you on. So, uh, you know, when you look out uh, across the, you know, our community, that is credit unions, what are the biggest challenges you're seeing that we're facing today? Relevancy. And uh, I say that not because I believe that we are irrelevant. But I say that because I think that we are losing our relevancy in the minds of the public. And I believe at some point we lost our way with how we describe ourselves and our industry. We tend to have in the past focused very much on how alike we look to our brethren at the, on the banking community, right? So our products and services, you know, everything pretty much on the front end looks the same. And we really, as an industry, focused on differentiating ourselves on price. I mean, how many times have you heard, you know, join a credit union and you get better rates on loans, you get better rates on your savings account, you know, and, and the past 20 years, that just has not been true. Yeah, yep. You know, so then it was all about service, right? Well, you know, you're not a number, you, you you know, you come in and we know you and we know your name and that kind of thing. Well, that may have been true in the more exclusive environment that I was talking about before prior to um, H.R. 1151. And, you know, post H.R. 1151, now we're we're more homogenized because we are serving local communities and you know, then it's like, well, let's differentiate ourselves on service. Well, instead, in my opinion, what we should be doing is focusing on if you put your direct deposit in a credit union, it helps your neighbor get a car loan. And that uh, grassroots community local uh, concentration is something that is very appealing to Gen X, Y, and Z. Uh, so the millennials and then the... Even us Gen Xers. <laughs> Yeah, the forgotten right. yeah, I'm X. <laughs> no. uh, Me too. You know, but, so X, Y, Z. I mean, you know, that like, keeping it local, you know, that has really gained popularity uh, in the minds of young people over the last 10 years or so. And that's exactly what we do. And now when you start talking about DeFi, this whole movement of decentralized finance, well, credit unions were the original crowd funders. Yeah, I love where you're going there. I really do. Gosh, I have to tell you, it, I appreciate that so much because one of the things that it, I, I love that you started with relevance, because I, not only like if we look over the past few years, I like the, the idea of too big to fail banks, you better move your money from them. And they've actually gained deposits, even in the last crunch that we've been seeing here. They're gaining deposits. And then when you think of, and I know you like the technology like I do as well, you just brought up DeFi, which might be a first on the show, which I love. You know, the, that idea that it's non-traditional players who have become more and more relevant over the past decade too, right? So for us to be able to, and none of them are local, quite honestly. So I love the absolute direction that you're going there. That's amazing. What has you most excited? And maybe I should switch this question now. What do we need to be doing? Like today, every, the credit union CEO is listening to you today. What do they have to be thinking about when they walk into their next strategic planning session? I think that we have to really look at the future of finance. And I think we need to be paying attention to the revolution that is happening right before our very eyes. You are seeing an uprising of people who are saying, I don't want traditional financial industry connection. I want something different, right? It's almost like a counterculture. It's it's kind of uh, the these people who are saying, you know what, I just, I really don't trust what is happening now for a lot of different reasons. And, and this is a groundswell. This isn't something that is just started happening now. And to me, it can be equated very similarly to the groundswell and the grassroots movement of credit unions, where people were saying, I don't trust the status quo. It's not benefiting me. It's benefiting some people, but it isn't benefiting me. So I'm going to go over here and figure out 
how to do it differently. And credit unions were one of the things that came out of that particular movement. And so now we kind of see this groundswell of, of moving toward, and I'll call it decentralized, but, you know, for the people type of movement. I want to control my own destiny. I don't want to have somebody telling me what I can or can't do. And I can get my friends to help me, right? I don't need you. I don't need this intermediary. I don't need this centralized organization that's selling my data and possibly exploiting my data and, you know, exposing my data to bad guys. You know, I I don't want that. I want to do something different. And I, I believe that credit unions are perfectly positioned to to be that trusted partner that gives you the power back. Power to the people. That's what credit unions are all about. We are democratically controlled financial cooperatives. And I think that there's a way if credit unions can embrace this new technology and new ways of doing things that we can really become the difference makers for the future. Okay. Complete rabbit hole. Didn't send you this question, but it's something that I now feel like I need to ask you. Um, <laughs> so a few weeks ago, I, I had the pleasure of moderating a panel and Linda Bodie was on it. And she, we were talking about, everybody's been talking about quite a bit, right? Since like all of us, one of your fellow NACUSO board members, uh, Mary Beth was, uh, she's a past guest to the podcast, friends with her. We've been to Africa together. We were at a conference in January and she was like, have you been playing with chat GPT yet? Right? Like, and so I give her full credit. And since that time, I'm like, oh, my God, where can we go with this? Right. But Linda, on the panel, we were talking about AI and where it could go. And she gave this example. She's like this idea that somebody could just say, I want a car loan that I can be approved for. Like everybody's trying to figure out what this example could be, but it's going to change things. So as somebody doing my homework for the show, it seems like you've always been a little bit ahead of the curve in credit unions when it comes to technology. Where do you, and I'm going to tie this to CUSOs in a minute, but what do you, again, think that for that, I always love to talk to that senior leader, the the CEO that's out there listening, and it's like, oh, crap, I don't even know what that means right now. So do you think that in your, it's early, but do you think that this is something that can help us in a way decentralize from the bigger banking system to to focus on us being more local? Because I, I do love, I don't know if there's a tie in there or not, but I'm going to throw it out there to you. <laughs> well, yes. I think that that there is a reason that credit unions should be paying attention to this, the future of finance, which I believe that decentralized finance is the future of finance. And, and you're already starting to see kind of the underpinnings of traditional finance start to unravel. And that's not new. That's been happening for decades, uh, but the the systems that we use in the the financial institution industry, not only in the banking industry, but in the credit union industry as well, you know, we have spent a lot of time making the front end really sexy and cool for our members. Right? We have we have poured millions of dollars of investment into making it easy to do business with us, and we have not, however, used that type of focus for our investment on the back end. And a lot of people will blame our cores. A lot of people will blame, you know, a a lot of things uh, for that. But we have seen some things happen recently where technology has allowed people to move very quickly, but our old antiquated systems systemically do not allow us to respond quickly And I think that that is a problem. So I think it's really important for us to pay attention to what consumers want. That That's a specialty of credit unions, right? We should understand intimately what our members want, how they want to do business with us, what they, uh, how they want to live. And I think that paying attention and educating ourselves about not only about the technology, which people can get really wrapped up in the technology and can get it can get really confusing to your point. You know, it's like, well, I don't even understand this. Well, let's educate ourselves. And yes, you need to understand the technology to a point. But what you really need to understand is the enablement that that technology provides, both for the member and for the credit union. And I think that that while there are some very large credit unions, comparatively, they're not really, none of us are are huge. 
And so what that means is we do have the ability to move more quickly uh, than some of our, you know, big banking brethren, because we just don't have the red tape that they do. And so I think that gives us an advantage. So I'd love to, now I'm going to pivot a little bit to collaboration. I am a, I just a huge fan of the, the idea of QSOs, right? As you said, we don't have, most credit unions don't have the capacity, the resources to, to do it all themselves. So this idea that we can partner to grow, I think personally that Nacuso has like this amazing opportunity in front of it, um, you know, as an organization to bring and be that hub of collaboration, you know, going forward. So it just, again, a, a huge fan and excited about what can possibly come from a, whether you want to take this from a Nacuso standpoint or from just QSOs in general, how can credit unions not only survive and stay relevant, but thrive because of this, what I think is a fairly unique thing that credit unions have in, a, in the QSO model. Thoughts? Collaboration, I believe, is our credit union superpower. And the reason I say that is because because of our history, regardless of where we might have have come recently in the last two or three decades, our roots were that we were focused on our local communities and we served our members. So because of that, we really didn't compete with each other. At my credit union, there are two credit unions on either side of my credit union. It's credit union row, right? So there's <laughs> you know one right after another. And when those buildings were originally built, we had different fields of membership. Now we're all community charter, but that spirit of collaboration and working together for the betterment of the whole still exists. And that is something that is absent in other financial institution around the world. That's one of my biggest pet peeves, I would say, is I remember years ago judging some kind of awards for like cues or something like that. And there, one of the questions on there was who was your biggest competitor? And anyone that wrote another credit union, I'm like, Bank of America is 90% of the market share, you know, like that, that's not our biggest competitor. So that idea of like, I love hearing, like you said, you have neighbors collaborate, right? Like, and I, I think that's missing a lot of the times over the past decade in our space, even like we have to call it out, right? I think it is. And collaboration is our superpower. And if that is our superpower, then QSOs are really our superhero because we can uh, utilize QSOs to help each other. So the great thing, and when I talk about QSOs to non-industry people and even credit union people who, who maybe have not, you know, been exposed to QSOs very much, I tell them, you know, QSOs are for-profit companies. Credit unions are not for profit. QSOs are for-profit companies that credit unions can invest in as, and use as long as that QSO helps other credit unions. And what an amazing, amazing model. And you can go anywhere with that. And my credit union is a testament to utilizing a QSO to achieve economies of scale. And we were able to do that by using a QSO who had technology expertise, particularly as it related to the QS to the infrastructure side of things, the network side of things, to modernize our our network infrastructure to achieve scale at pennies, minimal cost, because we were utilizing modern new technology that most credit unions, you know, their network was built in 1992 <laughs> and they've plugged things into it over the years, but they haven't really modernized it. And there's so much, you know, technology, it, it makes leaps and bounds in, you know, such a short period of time. So if you're using something, if you're using something you built in the same way that it was built in 1992, you're missing out on some opportunities. And so that's why Lone Star Credit Union founded Pure IT QSO. Because there wasn't really anybody in the credit union space that was providing that kind of infrastructure expertise. And there, there really still isn't. I mean, there, there are a few, but I, I would venture to say they're the premier provider in the credit union space for that thing. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. 
And what is so awesome is we can solve problems with QSOs and being able to help our credit union brothers and sisters and even helping other QSOs. I mean, just the amazing collaboration we're seeing amongst other uh, QSOs. I mean, you know, QSOs that, that can kind of come in and partner with Pure IT because they're doing ancillary things that plug into the network. I mean, it's just incredible. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, for a, a $30 million credit union to be able to afford a network architect, you know, and you're, you're paying for a tenth of that person. There isn't a way to describe how powerful that is. We started CEO Insight 15 years ago, and uh, there were we just recently had a founders meeting, and we're, we're kind of getting an update on a project that we were working on. And I, I called my co-founder David afterwards, and I'm like, "Holy crap, we're finally doing what we've wanted to do for literally 15 years, but we couldn't afford it as a small company, right? But now technology has brought it to a level where we didn't build it ourselves, but we were able to go out and get it to provide a better experience for everybody. And that to me is like. I think there's such an opportunity there. And I loved what you said about Pure IT, that you're able to work with other QSOs even to bring in because things change quick. This is not a, what's your five-year plan, right? Like this is like, what's happening in the next 18 months? <laughs> so um, I, I absolutely love that. Okay, I could talk to you about this for hours. Part of the show is the leadership side. So I need to dig into that with you as well, because I know you have, I have so many questions here too. For the person out there, a lot of folks that listen to the podcast are that senior leader who would like to quite honestly be sitting in your chair someday or a chair like yours. What advice do you have for that, that person who would like to be a CEO or the person who just wants to, you know, obviously make a, a career out of credit unions. Be curious, stay curious, ask questions. I think that that, that is. <laughs> you, you are out of, I'm sorry, I made a face that made B Becky laugh. We can see each other, even though we just record the audio. But I, you saying curious is literally this word that has been coming up over and over in my mind. You're saying all these words that I absolutely love. So I was just like, what, now curious? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> we share a spirit animal. Randy, I think it's apparently. what it is. Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> you know, people say curiosity killed the cat, right? But uh, I don't know if you know who uh, Schrodinger's cat is with quantum mechanics. So in quantum physics, the cat is in a box, but it's both alive and dead. And so when you, and somebody said this to me recently, curiosity killed the cat. I'm like, well, if it's Schrodinger's cat, then it's not dead. And it's not they dead. were like, yep. well, it's, you know, it is dead. It's like, but it's not dead. But it is dead, but it's not dead. <laughs> so, you know, I, we can get into quantum theory. And, um, you know, that's I'm an uber geek. So I, yes, I read about quantum theory, but curiosity is something that causes you to go, Hmm, what, what if, what if, what if we did things, something like that? What if we, we did that instead of this? Why, why are you doing that? When I, you know, I'm looking over here and it's like, well, this doesn't seem to make any sense to me. So stay curious. And I think a lot of times, regardless of what industry we're in, there is a period of time, especially when you're a new employee. So you're new into the credit union space, let's say. And I always say this for new employees that are coming in. There is a period of time where you are outside of the forest. And so you can actually see the forest for what it is. And that is a period of time when I want to take advantage because I want you to ask me questions because everything makes perfect sense to me because I'm in the forest. Yep. You've been here. But for you're a while, outside. So yeah. <laughs> and so you're going to see things that I will never see. And so I think trying to, as a leader, continually be curious and not because I think the the status quo breeds complacency. And I think you just have to constantly be challenging yourself on, does this still make sense? Things change rapidly. We just talked about that. So curiosity. Okay. So now this is a complete, and I apologize to everybody out there if they're like, that's not an interesting question, but this is a, Lauren and I, our CEO, we're just having this conversation. So if you have a hack here, this could help us greatly. How do you, in an interview process, find curious people? Because, like That's something we're like, wow, somebody lacks curiosity, but they could interview very well. But that's literally how much we've been talking about this is we're like, how do we find that curious person who wants to keep growing and learning and, you know, asking all the questions? Any tips there as you built out your team? 
Well, I, you know, I'm not perfect at interviewing. I mean, it, <laughs> and I don't know that anybody is. I mean, you know, no. how can you really know how somebody is going to be? Because there's so much that goes into whether it's a fit or not that that's oftentimes doesn't really have anything to do with the person. It can be, you know, the culture. Do they fit with the culture? I mean, there's all kinds of things. And, it, you know, in an hour or even a couple hour interview, it's just so hard However, I do think that you can properly vet uh, or appropriately vet based on behavioral questions. You know, you can say, okay, have you ever had a scenario where you disagreed with your boss? Tell me about that. And based on how they respond, I mean, if they say, well, no, I've never disagreed with my boss. Well, you know, X, eh, next person. Uh, because, I mean, of course, you you disagree with your boss. I mean, at every workplace at the water cooler, what what's everybody talking about? Yeah, what their boss absolutely. did that they didn't like or they disagreed with or, well, if I would, if this was me, I would have done that. So that is the start of curiosity going, why did they make that decision? And if I were in their shoes, what decision would I have made? And so asking those behavioral type questions or, you know, you were you were faced with a conundrum, you know, a crossroads. Are you going to, you know, take the left turn or the right turn? How do you make a decision? So I think it's behavioral scenario based questions that can help you kind of get into somebody's mindset as opposed to canned questions, you know, about, you know, tell me your strength <laughs> or your weakness or whatever. Absolutely. So I, I'm going to make an assumption here. I, I'm assuming you haven't surrounded yourself with non-curious people. So how do you now that you've you have your team, how do you create an environment where curiosity is celebrated and not shut down once they get into the forest? Well, the way you do that is by encouraging failure and people are not going to um, try new things or they're not going to question things if there's a negative reaction, right? So if you punish somebody for trying something and it didn't work out, then they're never, ever going to do that again. If you chastise somebody for questioning you, then they're not going to ever do that again. And so you have to, as a leader, um, I believe you have to walk the talk. So what that means is I have to set the example for how the organization is going to behave and respond. And what we do at Lone Star is we try new things all the time, all the time. We we ask a lot of these fintechs, and because I'm on uh, the board at NACUSO, I get exposed to all these really cool, fantastic, you know, innovative ideas. And these people who really don't have a purview into the credit union industry, they come in and they say, oh, we've really got this cool thing. We think it would work great like this. Well, I can come in and I can say, I mean, I have a, a very clear understanding of how the credit union industry works, especially on the back end. We talked about that before. And I can go, you know what? You have a really awesome idea, but it's not going to work exactly the way you think. Why don't you come in at Lone Star Credit Union and our team? is going to help you make that a credit union specific product because of what we know. So our team at Lone Star gets to try new things and play in the sandbox all the time. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But that creates a culture of curiosity, number one, and it has us unafraid of failing. I've in the past, uh, yeah, both you know Ray and Mary Beth have been on the podcast before, I, and I love there's a different mindset a lot of the times. It seems like with the folks that that, that play in the Nakuso sandbox, but um, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I'm just sitting here smiling and nodding so much when you're talking. I have a question for you about that. I, I absolutely love this idea that. Like, you know, through your association with Nacuso, you're able to to look at some of these new QSOs that are coming up or these fintechs that are coming in and say, here, let's 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 test this with us. Like, you know, like because you're missing something. Right. Like that's just helpful for the whole industry as a credit union, as a I look at this at CU Insight as a as a small business. We only have so much time, resources, energy. How do you. Number one, make that decision on what you're going to pursue 
And number two, which might be more important than something that I've struggled with, how do you know when to kill it and say, no more? We got to take that resource and go elsewhere, right? Like, um, that is something I fully admit on this show that I've went way too long on many things that I thought was a great idea. <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> so, Well, I think that you have to obviously prioritize and running a smaller card union, uh, we have limited resources, but I would would say that any business really, I mean, you all, your resources are always limited, right? Your money, <laughs> your people, your time. And so I, you have to prioritize and it, it's, it gets really complicated on where you place your priorities, but there is a book called the four disciplines of execution or 40 X. And it, it talks about this concept called the whirlwind where we get sucked into this whirlwind and we're just constantly spinning, 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 and we're really not focusing on any one thing. And so therefore we just don't get anything done. And so the 4DX philosophy says you have to have a wildly audacious goal, right? You just have this really crazy goal and that is what you focus on. And so for a card union, that could be our strategic plan. Right. Um, and and your strategic plan, a lot of times it's I've seen some strategic plans at Cardi and sometimes they're 10 pages long. And that is crazy. That's crazy. So our strategic plan at Lone Star Cardi Union is three things. That's it. Three things. And it starts with employee engagement equals member engagement, which equals growth. So at the end of the day, our big audacious goal, right, is growth. It starts with employee engagement. So we have to make our employees ha- happy, then it makes our members happy, and then we grow subsequently. But you you can't focus on a 100 things. And when you really talk about strategy and vision, it really should just be one thing. So when you're prioritizing your time, you say, okay, you know, we need X, Y, or Z. Well, does that help us achieve our overarching strategy, that one word that we're trying to focus on? And if it doesn't, we're not going to be spending our time on it. So, you know, you have your base things. You have your things that you have to do every day to keep the doors open, right? That, you know, you have to lend. You have to, you know, do your accounting. You have, I mean, there's, you know, you got to open your brain stores. You got to have good customer service. All of those things are just, those are just, the stakes of the game, right? That that's just how you have to start. But what you spend your time and resources on beyond that, it has to be that big audacious goal or it just, you know, and that's what we do. And when people come and they go, well, I think we need to do this. Okay. How does it achieve what we want to do? So you're always bringing it back to the big audacious goal. And the goal. same thing with killing a project. Is it still contributing to that overarching goal? Yes or no? If it's no, kill it. So is that something you're asking often, like in whether it's with your team or are you going back and looking at projects that you've started and saying, does this still work or is it still worth it? Or Well, one of the things that we focus on, too, is a process improvement and efficiency. And, you know, we ask our leaders to constantly look at what they're doing to see, does this still make sense? Because things change rapidly. And we all tend to think, human beings tend to think, well, it, it, you know, if I'm doing this right now and it works right now, it should just work forever, right? If I just keep <laughs> doing one, two, three, then it, it's just going to work. Well, the world changes, things change. And I, you know, I use an example all the time of your PC. Well, the reason your PC, your old PC gets slow right? It is not because it's old. It's because the operating system is expecting more from it. That's why the operating system is constantly being upgraded and updated and it's changing, but the hardware itself hasn't changed. And so we as hardware people, right? Because we tend to not want to change. We can tend to want to continue doing (laughs) the same thing. You know, you have to constantly ask yourself, it is what I'm doing still working? And so, yes, it's a, it's an everyday thing. It's not just a once a year where we go, okay, what are we going to do next year? And you plan it out because things change and you have to pivot. You're like, well, I mean, let's look at what has happened recently. I mean, yep. the budget we did six months ago. <laughs> <out the window. laughs> 
<laughs> Forget about it. Everything changed. The pandemic, what happened? Yeah, oh my gosh, absolutely. everything changed. So, yeah. you know, you have to be able to, to pivot. And so you've got to be able to look in real time and go, all right, it, do our plans still make sense? I, I want to ask you one more question in this, because in this kind of section of the podcast, and as a Gen Xer, more and more of my friends have started to become CEOs. And almost to a person, the thing that I hear almost surprised them most was the board relationship. Like, even if they dealt with the board before, they didn't understand that, like the funnel of the CEO position. As somebody who is, I would call you a progressive credit union, you're trying new things, you're pivoting. Not just bringing your team on board. My guess is you've surrounded yourself with people who like that. But from a board level, how do you make sure that the board's on board also and they're not like, slow down, Becky? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I think that, first of all, I think it's perfectly okay for the board to say slow down. Um, yeah, I think that that's all right. I think that's their job to to make sure that we're not moving too fast. So it's a good yin and yang. It's a good push and pull. You know, you have a super innovative, fast moving CEO and you have a very traditional credit union board and somehow you find a way to meet in the middle and that's where the magic happens. And so at my credit union, I got asked this recently too. I was like, Becky, you know, you're just like you said, you're innovative, you're forward thinking, you're utilizing technology. I mean, what does your board look like? I mean, people, I think, have this idea that our board <laughs> is just a bunch of, you know, teenagers. Pretty much. <laughs> and that's absolutely not true. That isn't true. So the board that I have today is the one that I inherited when I came to Lone Star Credit Union. So they're very well-versed in credit union ease. They get it. They understand it. They're very passionate about our members and our mission and being a credit union. But a lot of times, stereotypically, people feel like, well, that type of board is not going to be forward thinking. And, and I don't agree with that philosophy. And again, here we are. We embrace curiosity. We embrace questioning. So just because the board says, Becky, have you lost your mind? <laughs> I, you know, and I'm, I'm like, well, no. And here's why. But I don't come to the board and just say, well, guess what? This is what we're doing this now without any sort of prep or education or explanation or why is this? No, I mean, you have to do that. You have to, you have to to basically state your case. You have to prove your point. You have to go before the congressional committee, right? And you have to testify as to why you want to do what you want to do, or you have to clarify why you've done what you've done. And you have to have data to back it up. And you have to have... So the board is, is a governing body, certainly, but it's your job as the CEO to help them understand and recognize how we can utilize new things in order to achieve our goals. And, and that's really it. It's not just about a difference of opinion or that we're not trying anything new because we've always done it this way. I think there's a way to combat that kind of uh, mentality. And for, for many CEOs, they see it as more of an adversarial type of thing in some cases. And I don't. I see it more as a collaborative type of a thing. That's good stuff right there. This is painful, Jimmy. I hate to do this, but we got to start wrapping this up or we'll be here for hours. <laughs> this, thank you so much for being here. Always on the CU Insight experience. I wouldn't be it without it. We have some rapid fire questions. Your answers don't have to be rapid. Me just asking the questions is, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received and who gave it to you? The best piece of advice I received was back when I was in music retail and my manager showed me how to prioritize. And she actually wrote it on a piece of paper and it was prioritize my daily tasks by have to do, need to do, and if I have time to do. And I used the process that she taught me my whole career. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Okay, I'm jumping to this one just because you worked in music retail. What's the greatest album of all time? That one you can still listen to front to back. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. 
Uh, and that's the first time that's been mentioned in 150 plus episodes, which is really? kind of surprising now oh that I think God. about it. Yeah. <laughs> tells you a lot about me. So there, there you go. <laughs> I have a habit of doing this. I, while I'm listening to you, I'm also checking out the bookshelf behind you. Is there a book that you either think everybody should read? I see Sung Tzu's The Art of War behind you, <laughs> or that you've gifted to other people over your career? Well, there have been many. I'm an avid reader. Um, I prefer to read fiction instead of nonfiction. I think 4DX, the book that I mentioned earlier, uh, was something uh, that I would definitely recommend. But probably something that has been most profound for me over the years is understanding the four behavior styles. And so there is a book called uh, Personality Plus by Florence Litterauer uh, that helped me understand at a very early age that being different from other people is not a bad thing. What's taken up the Becky personal growth space, the, the self growth currently? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I talked about curiosity and keeping that alive. Of course, I'm spending a lot of time immersing myself in the whole DeFi space uh, right now and trying to learn everything that I can. Uh, blockchain interested me very early on because of the uh, decentralized servers or nodes. I mean, I'm a network enthusiast. And so I was like, oh my <laughs> That really sounds interesting. I really didn't know too much about Bitcoin back then or that, you know, Bitcoin rode on a blockchain. I didn't understand that. So that is taking up a lot of my time. Uh, economics. I mean, I read the Wall Street Journal every single morning. And so I, I take the time to immerse myself in this space so that I can learn and notice trends. So just keeping that curiosity alive is probably something that keeps me young. See, I'm, now I'm sitting here shaking my head, having to stop myself from going down a whole nother rabbit hole. But I'm also, it's my job to watch the time. So um, this is just a fun question. This came from uh, NCOE Chairman Harper after he was on the show. Who plays Becky in the movie biopic of your life? Reese Witherspoon. Awesome. <laughs> She's Southern. She's little. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> That's fantastic. When you hear the word success. Who's the first person that comes to mind and why? Condoleezza Rice. She is so, and I have her book behind me too. And what is so amazing about Condoleezza is I feel like, I mean, she's such an educated woman and, you know, I mean, she made it to Secretary of State. I mean, oh my gosh, you talk about a successful career, but she continues to call the shots for herself. She decides. I mean, so many people have asked her, you need to run for president. You know, you need to continue to be in politics. And, and, you know, she has has chosen her own path. And I really, really respect that. That's pretty cool. Last question for you here. Was there anything, number one, that you hoped I would ask you about that I didn't? Um, and number two, any final thoughts or asks that you would you have of our listeners? Well, we could have gone down a whole rabbit hole about Dark Side of the Moon. So, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's a whole nother podcast that we can... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've said it on the show, but mine's Guns N' Roses Appetite for Destruction. I still can say <laughs> <There you> it <laughs> a, a little um, later. But. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, what I would would leave the audience with and leave you with, Randy, is that Cardi Unions are not dead and don't count us out because I do believe very strongly that collaboration is how we are going to win in the future. Perfect way to wrap this up. If people have more questions of you, which I'm sure they will, what's your poison? Email, LinkedIn, how, how can people get a hold of you? LinkedIn, baby. There you go. We will link to Becky's profile as well. I, I have to personally thank Mike Lawson. I saw him at GAC and he was like, have you had Becky on your show yet? And I was like, no, why have I not? So thank you, Mike. You are not wrong. This has been amazing. <laughs> thank you so much, Becky, for doing this today. I can't wait for our paths to cross. I feel like I could have talked to you for hours. So. Oh, thank you. Likewise. We will link to everything that we talked about in the show notes today. Thank you again, Becky, for being here today. This conversation was an absolute blast. I cannot wait to continue it down the road with you, uh, hopefully in a few things before we go. Make sure to check out cues in the show notes and learn more about and, and register for the CEO Dialogue and be part of that conversation. Uh, they are a longtime partner of CEO Insight in the podcast, and I am grateful for their support to allow us to have this much fun doing what we do. Please also subscribe to the CEO Insight experience on your favorite podcast player. We're on them all. Apple, 
podcast spotify you pick it we're there uh and if you're looking for any of the books mentioned on the show whether it's today or in the past a quick google of the cu insight experience podcast book list and your next read is on its way from amazon last but certainly not least i want to thank all of you for listening y'all rock i appreciate the kind words that come in about the show i i look forward to future conversations and hopefully seeing you all soon be well